this morning's scripture is from Acts chapter 12. About the time that King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church, he had James, the brother of John, killed with a sword. After he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with chains, was sleeping with two soldiers while guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and the light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him up saying, get up quickly and the chains fell off of his wrist. The angel said to him, fasten your belt and put on your sandals. He did so. And then he said, wrap your cloak around and you follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize that what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and second guards, they came before the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of their own accord, and they went outside and walked along a lane, and suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I am sure the Lord has sent this angel to rescue me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. And he knocked, and, uh, excuse me, and he knocked the outer gate and a maid Rhonda came to the answer. She recognized Peter's voice and was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she insisted to say, no, it is his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hand to be silent and described for them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he added, tell this to James and the believers. And then he left and went to another place. When morning came, there was no commotion among the uh, soldiers over what had, what had become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and could not find him, he examined the guards and ordered them put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Syria and stayed there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him in a body after winning over Blessus, the king's chamberlain, and they asked for reconciliation because their country depended on the king's country for food. On the appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat on the platform, and delivered a public address to them. But the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not of a mortal. And immediately, because they had not given to the glory of God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. 
but the word of God continued to advance and adherence. Then after completing their mission, Barabbas and Saul returned to Jerusalem and brought with them John, whose other name was Mark. The word of God for the people of God. you to turn in your red Bibles, if you would, and uh, keep your finger in that spot, and it's in Acts chapter 12, which is page 131 in the New Testament, toward the, toward the back of the Bible. It'll help if you can keep your uh, Bible open right there as we talk about some of these things. God's work advances even in troubled times. And I would say killing Christians and putting them in, them in jail, they would call that troubled times, wouldn't you? The message of Christ is so powerful and God is so mighty that the Romans had four squads of soldiers guard and chain an unarmed man, Peter. And the church prayed and God delivered Peter by a mighty miracle. First, I want to say, why would they be that afraid? Why would you have to chain a nonviolent man whose believers, you know, of Christ are not going to try to break him out of jail? He's chained to two soldiers and has all these guards. Well, right there it says they know there's some power there. Why are they so afraid? You wouldn't be that afraid if you didn't think there was power there. People know there's power there. I, I was looking over, we know that communism doesn't, didn't allow, and I think still doesn't allow, uh, religion. They don't want God involved. They said, uh, one of the Marxist things was, they saw religion as retarding human development. They had all kinds of bad things they said about it. In the Soviet Union, they implemented rules of state atheism. Many religious buildings were demolished or used for other purposes. For example, in some of the Eastern European countries, uh, they used uh, churches to store their tanks. Lenin had made a decree uh, on December 25th, anyone who didn't come to work that day because they were celebrating Christmas should be shot. They formed groups, and this was really the name of their group. I got this on Wikipedia, so we'll see how it turns out. The Society of the Godless. How would you like that? Now, I hate to say it, though, we don't form those societies in the United States, but there, there are some groups that could be called the Society of the Godless. <laughs> they just don't call themselves that. But. And they also had the League of the Militant Godless. Unless we think this is just a thing of the past, just in 2015, and, and Dave was helping me with ch my Chinese, in the Hujang city of the... Oh, Dave, where are you? <laughs> Say the name of that place. It, it was Wanzhou oh, in Wanjo. the Zhejiang province. Okay, in case you know where that is, because he, he traveled to China a couple of times. But anyhow, just in 2015, in this one city in China, 200 Christian churches were targeted for demolition after being classified as illegal structures. And it had a picture right there on there. You know, people think that God's word is powerful, and they are right. Because when we have God and we have Jesus, we know that there's no power higher than that. And if some power wanted to do something evil or unjust, we wouldn't be able to follow that. And that's a power that governments and people have known for a long time. It started when the Christians first came about following Jesus. 
It's interesting that you'll see several times the word church. Look at the first, uh, on page 131, the very first verse. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. They're going to say church three or four times in here, and it's, they didn't have a building. They're not referring to a building. They're referring to believers. They did not have a building. So every time they said church, they're talking about the group of believers, not a building. On down it says the church prayed. And God delivered. The church was praying fervently. Let me see if I can find that. I should have written down. Okay, verse 5. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. The people of God, the believers, no building. They didn't have buildings yet. Remembering that, that God is all-powerful. We don't need buildings. And his word is so powerful, and we don't even realize it sometimes. But they even realized it at the beginning there that Peter had to be chained to soldiers and all these guards. For what? Because he had the truth. And the truth will set people free, and some folks don't want that. They're suffering and even martyrdom for Christ. James, the brother of John, had been killed for speaking the truth about Christ. So we know it's not all a wonderful deliverance. Sometimes there's really bad suffering. In the second verse of that chapter 12, if you see, a Herod, he had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. So not everybody was being delivered from the persecution. There is suffering for Christ. Then and even now, there is things that are worth dying for. Truth, God's truth is worth dying for. Righteousness, justice, goodness are worth dying for. And the early Christians knew as they proclaimed Christ, as they met together, they could uh, be killed for that even. I may have told you this before, but when I was uh, in seminary, it was just a few years ago actually, and there was a fellow from China in my class. And uh, he had been thrown in jail for having a Bible study at his house. And he told us, when you're in jail in China, they, they don't bring you, you don't get three meals a day. They don't give you food. If, if, if they allow a visitor to come in, they can bring you some food. And uh, I mean, in the class, we were appalled. We said, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. He said, it was nothing. He didn't. He thought it was worth it. It was worth it. He went out and had more Bibles. I don't know if they just changed locations or what, but and there he was in seminary planning to study and go back to China again. It's worth it, even when they're suffering. God decides when to do a miracle. But this thing is for sure, speaking the truth about Christ to non-believers, coupled with a church that is praying hard, will get results. An angel freed Peter, and Herod ended up having to leave town. Once again, so James died, but Peter gets delivered. We don't know what God's plan is, but the church's duty, and the church again were just people, no building, they were praying, and that's the church's duty to pray. And not just to, not to give up. And they were praying, weren't they, for an impossible situation. And that's why we pray even, uh, what we think, what, is, what are we going to be able to do against drugs in Mount Washington? That's an impossible situation for anybody to tackle. God specializes in the impossible. And that's why the early church, and why he still calls the church us to pray. And they believed and they prayed. And Peter was delivered. 
Let's look down and, and see uh, what was happening when the angel showed up. Look in verse 6. That very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter was bound with two chains and was sleeping between two soldiers while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. I want to notice Peter was sleeping. He wasn't up worrying all night what was going to happen to him the next day. He was sleeping. Is that trust or what? Is that willingness to say whatever happens, it's God's, it's God's plan? I thought that was amazing. He was just sleeping, chained there between soldiers. This story, you know, sounds so fantastic. You say, could this really have happened? But you know, there's even recent missionaries that said they were uh, sneaking Bibles into some country. And they had them in different boxes, hoping to camouflage it, but uh, one of the border guards opened the box and they thought, well, this is it. And for some reason, they didn't realize it was a Bible. I don't know what God made them see, but it was a miracle. And they just had them go on. God can do miracles, things that we would never believe could happen. And he still does miracles today. Every changed life for the Lord is a miracle. And even keeping people from the evil that they could have done, as we want to help our young people know about the Lord, the best miracle is having a clean, good, godly life. And not having to say, I had to turn from terrible sin, but just even from a young age to be able to, to follow the Lord. I'm sold on these uh, summer lunch programs. We started one at my uh, last church. We said any school age child, we, you think mainly you're going to get elementary school kids, and mainly, mainly we did. But we had uh, two boys come from football practice, and they were hungry. And we had this little chicken nuggets and stuff, and then one lady says, what are we going to do? I said, just keep feeding them until they're full. <laughs> keep putting more chicken nuggets in until, because high school, you know, they didn't need three little nuggets like the little elementary school kids did. But they, they stuck around, and we read stories like Noah, and they said, I've never heard that before. Never. You know, in the United States, we're, we're in a missionary area now. People don't know the basic stories of the Bible. And we're told in the New Testament, how are they going to believe unless they've heard? They've got to hear from somebody. It looks like the church even now needs to go outside of the walls, doesn't it? Or do something different because they're not all going to show up here on, on Sunday morning. There's things that I want us to pray about. And if you'll get out your handout, it's a yellow handout in your uh, bulletin. Now, I'm, the preacher's always telling you to pray, right? So I thought, well, I'm going to help you here. You can, this is what I want us to do for the next few weeks. You can hang this on your refrigerator or whatever. On Monday, I want you to be praying throughout the day, thanking God for our freedom and asking the Lord, may I speak words that give you glory, Lord. Let's pray that prayer with me. Let's just say, may I speak. May I speak words that give you glory, Lord. And we're thanking him for our freedom. On Tuesday, we're going to pray. Let's pray. Let's say that aloud together. May we spread the truth of Christ to school children so that violence will end in the schools. Did you notice that they took out prayer from the schools? They took out Ten Commandments. And has that helped? No. That has not helped. That, they're talking about freedom from religion. That's not what helps people. God helps people to know the good and the right. Amen? Let's pray Wednesdays. May we spread God's truth to young parents in our community in order that their marriages will be healed and their families saved. 
even uh, Kim Daly, our director here, says that sometimes over half the parents that start out together with uh, young children will uh, be divorced, uh, even while they're attending here. So our young families need lots of help. On Thursday, let's pray this together. We pray that we will spread the light and truth of Christ so that the chains of drug addiction will be broken. And we'll pray that, and if you want to make some action, show up at 7 o'clock that night for the coalition and help what, what we have plans for in Mount Washington. On Friday, let's pray this together. We pray that your truth will spread in our land as we give our Bibles and gospel literature. I keep praying from even the Gideons that gave the 200 Bibles out of Turpin. You know, we need to pray that God opens the eyes and has the kids open the Bibles and then opens their hearts and put prayer behind that. Amen? Okay, on Saturday, let's pray this together. Lord, help us spread your truth and pray that your truth will spread throughout our country. Amen. And then Sunday, let's do this. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will work through our church so that every corner of Mount Washington will know you and honor you. We need to pray against the impossible. We say we see a few people in church, we believe we can pray and ask God to add to that. We see drug addictions around us. We can pray for the impossible that God can take charge. Use this if you would. The church was praying. They said over and over again in Acts 12, you know what made these things happen? The church was praying. The church was praying. That's how, how and why God answered those prayers. That's what God calls us to do. That the church was praying. And of course, the believers, Peter and others, were giving out the truth in any way they could. Stand up and say it, pass out literature. I'm going to brag about Scott again. I kept bringing him. How many Gideon Bibles did you bring Scott in the hospital? One. 20. He, he passed them all out. I brought him Bible promise books, all kinds of upper rooms, passed all those out. Wherever we are, we can give out God's word. In fact, when he was, I was sitting visiting there, uh, one, one lady, African-American lady, wheels herself in with, with the wheelchair, and he knew her, Miss Melinda, he says. And, you know, he's being friendly to everybody, so they want to come in and say hi. He said, will you take this Bible promise book? Yes, she said. And so she rolls down the hallway. I'm still visiting about five minutes later. She came back, another lady wants one. You got another one? <laughs> yeah, we do. We got this whole stack. So uh, wherever you are, give out God's word. And he had some prayer with some nurses that, uh, you know, had some bad family situation. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. So let's be praying. Let's be a praying church. And um, there's a song that we don't sing too much, an old hymn that said, If you can't preach like Peter. If you can't pray like Paul, just tell them of the love of Jesus and that he died for all. Okay, that's a simple message.